Introduction of Railroads from the Investor's Viewpoint. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Railroads from the Investor's Viewpoint by the Federal Securities Corporation. Introduction. Throughout the country, there is manifest a widespread interest in the railroad situation and in railroad investments. It is no new interest, for the railroads have always occupied an important place in the activities of the country, but more recently this interest seems to have grown wider. This is probably due to two factors. First, to the constantly changing aspect of the railroad situation during the past four or five years, and the changing aspect of the problem which it has been necessary for the railroads to face. Second, to the various railroad offerings involving large amounts of money at high rates of interest, which have been so readily absorbed by the investing public. During 1921, the railroads of the United States needed approximately $456 million to take care of maturing obligations. It has been estimated by Mr. John J. Eschke, who is one of the joint authors of the Transportation Act passed by Congress early in 1920, that the railroad companies will, in addition, need about $1.5 billion of new money each year for a period of from three to five years. This amount of financing will bring before the public a great many issues of bonds of varying degrees of worth. The situation is and has been so complicated and the individual investor so unlikely to have the opportunity to investigate its ramifications fully that this little booklet is offered in the hope that it will help the investor choose his investments with wisdom. Such a booklet should, in our opinion, one, deal briefly with the past history of the railroads up to the outbreak of the European War, two, give in more detail the situation since that time up to the present, and three, outline to investors the factors which should be considered in choosing railroad investments. In this booklet, we shall endeavor to deal briefly with all three. End of introduction. Read by Elsie Selwyn. Section 1 of Railroads from the Investor's Viewpoint by the Federal Securities Corporation. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From Civil War to World War, Part 1. Early History The very early history of the railroads of this country can be passed over very briefly because the more recent history is more important for our purpose. The story of the railroads of this country is almost kaleidoscopic in retrospect and therefore highly interesting. In the early days, before the carriers were placed under the jurisdiction and control of the Interstate Commerce Commission, the situation gave a free rein to shrewd and clever operators to use the railroads for their own ends, either for the purpose of manipulation to make profits in the stock market in the manner of Jay Cook and Jay Gould, or to build up a tremendously powerful structure, such as E. H. Harriman built up with the Union Pacific as a nucleus. We have said that the story of the roads is one of constantly changing situations. Roads like the New Haven, the stock of which for many years was considered one of the sound investments in the country, and the space of a very few years under the control of Mr. Mellon, was brought to such a pitiable plight that the United States authorities were forced to intervene in an attempt to correct the situation. This road, formerly prosperous, is today going along at a starvation rate, and it would seem as though the prospect of dividends for the stockholders is exceedingly remote. The Boston and Maine, another of the New England roads, paid dividends on its stock uninterruptedly for a period of practically 70 years, until, in 1914, the same influences which wrecked the New Haven involved it also to such an extent that its dividends were passed. The Maine Central, another prosperous New England road, which had paid dividends practically as long as the Boston in Maine, in the early part of 1921 also passed its dividend. These instances show change from prosperity to starvation, which is also duplicated in the histories of the Alton and the Rock Island. But of more general and wider interest is the change from weakness and even bankruptcy to great strength. 
This latter is the history of such splendid properties as the Northern Pacific, the Atchison, the Union Pacific, and the Southern Pacific, all of which have thrived and grown wealthy as the new country into which they have reached has developed. Again, there are some properties which have not had to learn the folly of early overexpansion or early overcapitalization, but have had a steady, healthy growth with sane financing and sane operation from the very beginning. This group includes such great properties as the Pennsylvania, the New York Central Lines, the Louisville and Nashville, and the Illinois Central. Again, there is that group of roads which have started in weakness, continued in weakness, and now remain in weakness. The Erie, the Wabash, the Missouri Pacific, the Frisco, the Seaboard, and the Mobile and Ohio are types of this group. Roads, as well as individuals, do not stand still. History shows that their fortunes are constantly either ascending or descending. As the country has grown and population and industry have shifted, the fortunes of the railroad companies have shifted. In the early days, 100 miles of line was considered a maximum for efficient operation, and this remained the standard up to about 1870. About that time, the Illinois Central, with a mileage of perhaps 700 miles, was considered, and actually was, one of the greatest railroad systems in the world. We believe the figures show that until after the Civil War, with perhaps one or two exceptions, there was no railroad in the country with a mileage of over 1,000 miles. It is interesting to note that the Chicago and Northwestern Road operated with only a little over 100 miles of road almost up to 1860. By 1866, this had grown to only about 500 miles. It is stated that in traveling from the Missouri River to New York before the Civil War, it was necessary to change cars at least seven times. Of course, as the country grew, such small transportation units made for great inconvenience in traveling, and for this reason, among others, consolidation began to be affected. Consolidation The first period of real consolidation of railroads was the 20 years from 1870 to 1890, at which latter date the maximum length of line was about 5,000 miles. About 1880, the Pennsylvania had approximately 4,000 miles of line, while in 1886, the Chicago and the Northwestern, which we mentioned above, reached about 3,500 miles of line, although this was very shortly increased to about 5,000 miles. By 1889, the Union Pacific owned 2,000 miles of line and controlled about 4,000 more. The next period of consolidation was in the 20 years between 1890 and 1910, during which time systems of 10,000 miles of line or more first began to appear. The last 10 years of this period was the greatest era of expansion that this country has ever seen, or probably ever will see. During this time, more than 300 railroads were added to those that were already operating, but so many consolidations took place that the actual number of roads operating in 1910 was only 829 as compared with 849 in 1900. This shows how rapidly the various operating units in the country were combining into large single systems. This tendency towards consolidation was checked for a time during the years of depression of 1893 to 1897, when occasional dismemberment of some properties took place. The Frisco, for example, was divorced from the Atchison, and the Union Pacific lost the Oregon Short Line. But out of the chaos of this period developed the more or less permanent operating units which we now have in this country. The figures in connection with the consolidations of the period from 1890 to 1910 are quite startling. During the four years before the Panic of 1903, over 400 railroads, aggregating about 32,000 miles of line, were merged or consolidated. During this period also, the systems which in the 90s comprised 10,000 miles of line grew to be groups which owned or controlled 15,000 to 20,000 miles of line. It is interesting that in the space of a little over one year, 1899 to 1900, over 25,000 miles of railroad were absorbed or combined in one fashion or another. As there are now about 200,000 miles of road in the country, we see that more than one-eighth of this entire mileage was, during the space of a little over one year, absorbed or combined in some manner. As an example of growth, we might mention the Rock Island, 
which grew from 3,800 miles in 1901 to 15,000 miles about five years later. But the really spectacular growth was that of the Union Pacific. This road in 1906 actually controlled 25,000 miles of line, and through stock ownership, Mr. Harriman had influence over 30,000 miles besides. This spirit of combination grew to be so strong and seemed to be so permanent that for a time it appeared as though the traffic of the country was definitely and for all time to be divided between certain groups of roads which seemed to have understandings with each other. But the attitude of the public largely counteracted this influence and culminated in the Sherman Antitrust Act. The consolidations which had been built up began about 1910 to go to pieces. The Gould Group, the result of an ambitious but weakly constructed plan for an ocean-to-ocean -ocean system, fell apart because of lack of strength. The Rock Island came to grief, and its holding companies were dissolved because of internal corruption. The Union Pacific and the New England monopolies were dissolved by mandate of the Department of Justice of the United States. It is not possible to elaborate within the scope of this pamphlet, but the steps by which these various systems grew into being and into a position of power and then into a period of decline are most interesting. The story of the rise and fall of the New England monopoly, the working out of the problems of the Pennsylvania and New York Central and furthering traffic amity between themselves and their competitors in their territory, the tremendous expansion of the Union Pacific system under E. H. Harriman, its final dissolution and its subsequent development under saner methods, these are all most interesting stories but involve too much detail to be set down here. Manipulation There are, however, some phases of the history of the railroads up to the period of government control which it seems necessary to dwell on a little further. At one time or another, various roads have been made a football of by the men who were running them for their own personal gains. One of the best examples of this practice was the manipulation of the Rock Island lines by the more Reed interests. The Rock Island originally was one of the fine properties of the country and had paid dividends on its stock from about the time of the Civil War up to the time when it was taken over by the more Reed interests in 1902. At that time, they purchased a large amount of the outstanding stock of the Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific Railway Company in the open market in order to gain control. Their idea was to manipulate this property in such a way that they could make money out of it for an inside ring, and still to maintain control of the property without actually having any large amount of investment in it. The capital stock of the railway company, which was the operating company, amounting to about $75 million, was pledged as security for a like amount of collateral trust bonds of the Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific Railroad Company, which was organized to own the stock of the railway company. Capitalized at $145 million, it in turn was owned through exchange of shares by the Rock Island Company, chartered with a capital stock of $139 million. Thus, all three of the companies were bound together, and by marketing the collateral trust bonds of the railroad company, the promoters reimbursed themselves for their outlay in buying up the stock of the operating or railway company. The control of the whole structure lay in a small amount of the Rock Island Company preferred stock, owned by the more Reed interests. The road, about 4,000 miles long at the time of acquisition, was immediately expanded to about 15,000 miles, and in the effort to pay dividends, was allowed to go to pieces, with the result that in 1914 the system went into receivership. Overcapitalized, overexpanded, highly manipulated, and under-maintained, there could have been no other result. The preferred stock of the Rock Island Company, which had been originally quoted around 86, had by 1908 reached about 20, and six years later was quoted 1 and 3 eighth. There were numerous other instances of the same character in the affairs of other lines of the country. At various periods, speculation in the railroad shares was tremendous. For example, in 1901, the capital stock of the Union Pacific was sold 21 times over, of the St. Paul 22 times over, of the Atchison 12 times, of the Erie and the Wabash 10 times, while in one single day in April 1901, 652,000 shares of the Union Pacific changed hands in a single session of the stock exchange. 
This represents more than half of the entire capital stock of this company. Again, in 1906, there was another frenzied period of the same character, when during the year, 43 million shares of Reading Common Stock changed hands. In fact, the capital stock of the Reading in the past has always been a speculative football. In 1904, its common stock was handled seven and one-half times over, in 1905, 16 times, and in 1906, the period mentioned above, 31 times. It is reported that during the third week of April 1909, the sales of its common stock equaled one half of the total outstanding. Various methods have been used by insiders at different times with the purpose of manipulating markets so as to make profits for themselves. Prior to the jurisdiction of the Interstate Commerce Commission, it was always possible to defer the customary outlays for maintenance, etc for the purpose of continuing to pay dividends. Orders to get traffic at any cost would be sent out, thereby increasing the revenues of the company without putting the proper amount back into the road. Such tactics were charged against the Atchison in 1890 at the time when Baring Brothers were heavily interested in this property. In the early 90s, the B&O also was said to have been guilty of deliberate falsifications of accounts by insiders in order to create a market to unload securities at high prices. In the case of the B&O, for example, during seven years, dividends amounting to about $6 million had been paid out, whereas a later accounting showed that probably less than $1 million had actually been earned. We are all familiar with the various pools that have, at one time or another, operated in railroad securities. The famous Keene Pool of 1902 to 1903, which was an attempt to purchase a large block of stock of the Southern Pacific and by control of the directorate to force the management to stop its policy of putting money back into the property so that higher earnings would be reported and thus afford the pool the opportunity of unloading the stock on the public at increased prices. There was also the famous Gates pool, which at the time when the L&N was about to issue $5 million of new stock, purchased a majority of the outstanding shares of this road and forced the Morgan interests to repurchase this stock for them at a handsome profit. The practice of padding or starving income statements has in the past been one of the most prolific sources of profit to insiders in the case of speculatively managed railroads, but under the supervision of the Interstate Commerce Commission, such manipulation is now practically impossible. Stock watering. Another practice which has at various times in the past been prevalent has been that of stock watering or the issuance of stock for purely speculative purposes. For example, the Erie between 1868 and 1872 had its capital stock increased from 17 million to 78 million primarily for manipulation in the market. It has been said that convertible bonds were put out by this road during these years to such an extent that they were limited only by the capacity of the printing presses. We have already reviewed the situation of the Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific Railway Company and its two holding companies, showing the tremendous inflation of a capital account. The total capitalization of these three companies amounted to $1.5 billion, which was controlled by a little more than 5 million of preferred stock. Unscrupulous or designing managers of properties have been able so to manipulate the affairs of the roads in the past that the burden on the property in the way of interest charges became absolutely impossible. The New Haven, which we have mentioned before, is a case in point. Within nine years to 1912, the outstanding securities of this property were increased from 93 million to 417 million, although only 50 miles of line were added during that time. New issues of stock and bonds during this period brought in, in cash, $340 million, most of which was invested in properties outside the sphere of the railroad's own activities namely in trolley companies, steamship lines, electric light and power plants, docks, and water frontage. This situation was brought about by an absolute disregard of the interests of the public or of the shareholders of the road and was largely planned for the benefit of certain insiders. 
So bad did this situation finally become that the federal authorities were in 1914 forced to intervene and order the dissolution of these various properties. The most famous instance of all, which illustrates probably every abuse possible, is the manipulation by E. H. Harriman of the Chicago and Alton Railroad. For years, this property had been considered one of the finest and best managed in the country. Over a space of about seven years, beginning in 1898, the capitalization of this road was expanded from about $34 million to about $150 million, although, according to the accounts of the road, only about $18 million had been expended in improvements and additions to the property. It seems, therefore, that securities totaling over $62 million were sold to the public during that time without $1 of consideration. This amount added practically 66000 a mile to the capitalization of the road and burdened it with a debt from which it has never recovered. The road was passed from syndicate to syndicate in the course of each step of which insiders made a profit, and it was finally sold to the Rock Island who could ill afford to handle a property so tremendously burdened. In the past, methods which were permitted in keeping accounts afforded very favorable opportunities for increases in capitalization and for other manipulations by insiders. Happily, not all of the railroads in the country have followed these practices. Many have liberally utilized their surplus earnings to build up their properties. The Pennsylvania, for example, for years followed the dollar-for-dollar -dollar policy of spending literally one half of its income for maintenance, upkeep, and betterments. During the period between 1887 and 1911, the Pennsylvania put back into its lines east of Pittsburgh $262 million of earnings. The Chicago and Northwestern during 20 years up to 1913 set aside $77 million out of its net income of about $200 million and put it either into improvements or carried it over to surplus. In the South, the Louisville and Nashville took $18 million out of its earnings in eight years prior to 1907 to put back into its property. This amount was equal to over 30% of its capital stock, while the total surplus built up to 1912 was equal to 90% of the capital stock. The roads which have followed this character of policy, keeping themselves clear of the evils of overcapitalization and manipulation, have continued to thrive and to grow, and fortunately, as time has gone along, fewer and fewer roads have practiced these evils. Those that have have learned through bitter experience that no road can live and grow under such practices, and that only with conservative capitalization and sound, sane operating methods may a road build for itself a strong place among the carriers of the country. Roads seemingly have had to learn these things by experience, just like individuals, but when the lesson has once been learned, its good effects have usually been lasting. Some of the strongest properties in the country today are those that in the past have been guilty of the worst practices and even become involved in the most serious difficulties. We must not take these records too seriously in considering the railroads of today because such practices are next to impossible under the jurisdiction of the Interstate Commerce Commission. However, since we are reviewing the past history of the railroads of the United States, we must face the facts as they are, even while we realize that in most cases, the lurid spots of the past are the very foundation of the strength of the present. Many a road is prosperous and thriving today only because difficulty in the past, and even receivership and foreclosure, has forced the managers to a basis of sound financing and efficient operation. It is only when roads have practiced bad methods that they have become involved in trouble. But since so many of them have had to learn their lesson, a brief survey of the financial difficulties that they have gone through must be considered if we are to get a correct idea of the situation. End of section one, read by Elsie Selwyn. Section two of Railroads from the Investor's Viewpoint by the Federal Securities Corporation. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From Civil War to World War, Part 2. Receivership. At one time or another, practically one half of the railroads of the country have been in receivership. That is a startling statement. 
Receiverships and reorganizations in the railroads of the United States have been brought on usually by one or more of the evils which have been discussed above. The aggregate number of receiverships and the aggregate mileage involved reach astounding totals. Certain figures that we have seen show that since 1875, over $8 billion of stock and bonds of the railroad companies of the United States have gone through receivership manipulation, while over $7 billion have actually come under foreclosure sale. This is a total of over $15 billion, which is almost equal to the total aggregate valuation of all the railroads allowed by the Interstate Commerce Commission in their recent decision. This allowed value was about $18 billion. As the present total capitalization in stocks and bonds of all the railroads in the United States is something over $16 billion, it will be seen that there has been in receivership during the past 40 years an amount of securities practically equal to the present capitalization of the railroads and almost equal to their present physical value. Moreover, the mileage which has been affected by foreclosure and receivership since 1875 is, roughly speaking, about equal to the present total mileage of the United States. Overexpansion in the early days of railroad construction, both before and after the Civil War, when Congress and the state legislatures were recklessly voting land and money appropriations for railroad aid and construction, expansion was quite a natural result. In many cases where land grants were given and subsidies voted, the promoters were unscrupulous men who did not stop to consider whether the population of a district made a railroad a necessity. Their only idea was to get the line constructed that they might gain the benefit of the appropriations and of the land grants. This was true in the case of the Northern Pacific, which under Jay Cook expanded too rapidly in a sparsely settled territory and in 1873 came to grief. This was the trouble also with the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, which was forced into receivership in 1887 and again went to pieces in 1893. In 1893 also, the Northern Pacific was forced into its second receivership largely because of overexpansion, and branch lines which were unprofitable because they ran into unsettled territory and ended nowhere. The Atchison, in 1871, had only 471 miles of line, but by 1888 had expanded to 7,000 miles, 2,700 of which had been constructed or acquired in two years in an ambitious attempt to reach Chicago, the Pacific Coast, and the Gulf of Mexico at one and the same time to make a transcontinental railroad out of a local line. Overcapitalization Overexpansion, however, was not the only factor that brought grief to the roads that we have mentioned. In all of these cases, and in practically each one where overexpansion has had its effect, a second influence has operated to cause receivership and reorganization. This is overcapitalization. We have seen how this evil brought ruin to the Rock Island system, and we have briefly reviewed the tremendous overcapitalization of the Chicago and Alton within the space of a very few years, which brought this splendid property to a condition of weakness from which it has never recovered. We are all familiar with the receivership of the Cincinnati, Hamilton, and Dayton in recent years, but we may not all know that the difficulties of this road were brought on because in two years the bonded indebtedness of the company was piled up from $12 million to $48 million, while its floating debt, which at the beginning of that two-year period was almost nothing, grew in the end to about $10 million. In overcapitalization, of course, it is not so much the excessive amount of preferred or common stock which brings on trouble, as it is an overloading of bonds, which means an overloading of fixed charges. Weak roads like the Wabash, for example, have had almost no chance to get into a position of strength because of the fact that they were so loaded with fixed charges that no margin of surplus was left for development or upkeep of the property. The Erie, which is one of the classics in the history of receiverships of railroads in the United States, has come in and gone out of receivership in foreclosure sale more times than any other road in the country, largely because the men who were in power were robbing the road by piling up indebtedness, 
usually in the form of collateral trust bonds with little or no security back of them. This road again and again was guilty of the practice of issuing new obligations in order to provide funds to take care of the interest on the old ones, so that in 1857, in 1873, in 1884, and a fourth time in 1893, the road went into receiver's hands and in 1908 escaped a fifth time only by the slightest possible kind of margin. Other instances in more recent times are the Missouri Pacific and the Frisco, which was forced into receivership because of overcapitalization and of increasing fixed obligations until they were more than the earnings of the roads could possibly bear. Fraud and Deception The third case for receivership, a cause which goes hand in hand with the other two which we have just mentioned, is fraud and deception, coupled usually with speculation. In the case of the Atchison receivership, for example, income had been overstated for years. The Baltimore and Ohio, too, was forced to suffer through the practice of its owners in falsifying income statements. While the real situation in connection with the Chicago and Alton during the time of the Harriman control was not given out to the public, and it would seem was not even known to the Rock Island at the time that the latter purchased control. It is said that deception had its part in almost every railroad that was ever owned or controlled by Jay Gould. The troubles of the Gould roads, of course, have been many. Practically every one of them except the Denver and Rio Grande has gone into receivership, and even this road is at present in a very precarious position. Starting from the west, these Gould roads include the Western Pacific, the Missouri Pacific, the Wabash, the Wabash-Pittsburgh Terminal, and the Wheeling and Lake Erie, all of which have known receivership. We all know of the ambitious attempt which he made to combine these parts into a transcontinental system running from ocean to ocean, but which went to pieces in 1893. Periods of Depression There are certain outstanding periods in the history of the railroads. First, there is the Panic of 1873 to 1877, before the modern railroad was evolved, when over 10% of the mileage of the country went into receivership and one-fourth of the total bonded indebtedness defaulted on its interest. Second, in the panic year of 1883, and over a period lasting until 1887, another large group of roads went into receivership. At this time, 11,000 miles of line were taken over by the receivers. Third, the panic years of 1893 to 1895, when the number and extent of receiverships broke all records. Statistics show that on June 30th, 1894, 192 companies were in the hands of receivers, while the total mileage involved by the companies was in excess of 40,000 miles. The total amount of capitalization, namely of stocks and bonds, of these roads aggregated about $2.5 billion, or about one quarter of the total railroad capitalization at that time. Fourth, in 1907, a period of financial distress, 18,000 miles of road went into receivership. Fifth, we all remember the time of apprehension of 1913 and 1914 when about 600 million of notes and bonds were involved in financial difficulties. Of course, in practically every one of these cases, the weakness in the road was there before the financial stringency came on. A period of financial distress merely crystallized the situation and hastened a result which in many cases undoubtedly would have followed in regular course. In all of these situations, the primary cause of failure was inability of the railroads to pay their fixed charges out of earnings. Reorganization Similarly, in reorganization, the problem has been to reduce the funded indebtedness either in par value amount or in interest rate, so that the total obligations of the company would be within its earning power. This has not always been done in receivership. In the first Atchison receivership, for example, and also in the first Northern Pacific receivership, the amount of funded indebtedness was not cut down, nor were the interest charges reduced. As a matter of fact, in the Northern Pacific case, the amount was increased instead. The result was that both of these roads again went into receivership when the financial depression of 1893 to 1895 came upon the country. Most of the reorganizations, however, have followed the basic principle of reducing the fixed charges, 
Some have accomplished the purpose by drastically reducing the amount of funded indebtedness outstanding per mile. Others have not reduced the par value amount of funded indebtedness, but have reduced the interest rate, as in the case of the second Northern Pacific receivership, which cut the interest charges in two without any decrease in the funded indebtedness. Others, again, have brought about the same result not by reducing the interest charges, but by making a part of the interest charges payable only if earned. In the second Atchison reorganization, this was done and part of the bonds which were reissued to the holders of the old obligation were made adjustment income fours, the interest on which was payable only if earned. Strong Roads we have laid a good deal of stress on the various difficulties which railroad operation has encountered in the past, but we also wish to emphasize the fact that these weaknesses have not been prevalent among the roads as a class. It is said that the annals of a peaceful nation are short. Similarly, we can sum up in a few words the story of those roads which were started under sane principles of finance and operation, have continued under the same principles, and today remain secure properties. The weak roads, poorly financed, overexpanded, and subject to manipulation, have been up and down, and much must be said to cover their varied history. The strong roads, on the other hand, do not figure in this history, but their story is one of gradual growth and mileage and prosperity. They have expanded slowly and at the right times. As the territory has grown and the industries within it have thrived, the roads have been expanded and have prospered. They have put money back into the property at the right times so that their roadbed and equipment has been properly maintained. Again, they have not been guilty of overexpansion. We all are familiar with the names of these roads. There are outstanding systems of this character in the east, in the west, and in the south. In the east, we have the New York Central, which is merely an end-to-end -end consolidation of a great number of roads which were built by various parties. This property always has and does today enjoy a splendid reputation. Dividends have been paid constantly since 1870. The Lake Shore, which is part of this system, is considered one of the finest pieces of railroad in the country. The Michigan Central is also a splendid property and has paid continuous dividends over a long period of years. The Pennsylvania is an example of a road which has grown and expanded under conservative principles of capitalization as the territory and as industries within the territory have grown. We all know that this property has paid dividends continually since 1856 and that the management, decade after decade, has stood out for their principle of maintaining the efficiency of the property regardless of stock market or other influences. The Norfolk and Western, which is practically a Pennsylvania property, as the latter owns over $38 million of its common stock, is also a road of this same class, which enjoys a splendid reputation. In the Middle West and the West, one of the outstanding properties is the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy. This road began as a branch line between Chicago and Aurora in 1849, has grown gradually, and has built feeders in its territory as the population has grown. Today, this road is called the Mother of Railroad Presidents because it has produced so many and enjoys the reputation of being one of the finest pieces of property in the country. Its principle of expansion was to build new lines in the territory only as the population warranted. The Great Northern, on the other hand, which, with the Northern Pacific, jointly controls the C, B, and Q, under Mr. Hill adopted a little different method of expansion. Mr. Hill's policy was to build a road in a territory which he was sure would be productive, and then pull the population in after him. We all know what a tremendous success Mr. Hill made of a defunct railroad company which he and his associates purchased in 1878, in which he, with his foresight and judgment, expanded carefully and conservatively into one of the splendid systems of the country. The Chicago and Northwestern is another road whose affairs have been conducted under a sane conservative policy, which has never since very early times been in difficulties. Dividends have been paid by this company almost continually since 1864, to date, over $70 million have been paid in preferred dividends to stockholders and over $120 million in common dividends.
The Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul also enjoyed a similar reputation for a great many years, but more recently this property has suffered from one reason or another. Its principles of capitalization are not as conservative as the other roads which we have mentioned, and it has been said that the building of its Puget Sound extension was an expansion which was not warranted at the time. In any case, this road, which for years has been a strong one, is today struggling to keep its place. In the South, also, there are two splendid properties. The Illinois Central, the outstanding one of these, has uninterruptedly paid dividends since 1863, and the Louisville and Nashville, with the exception of eight years in its early history and five years in the 90s, has also paid dividends since 1864. We have previously mentioned in this pamphlet how these two roads have maintained the efficiency of their properties by reinvesting earnings in roadbed and equipment. There are other roads which today occupy a very strong position into which they have grown only after they have encountered difficulties in the past. The Norfolk and Western is really a road of this character, as it experienced receivership early in its history. We have previously mentioned the Northern Pacific, Atchison, Union Pacific, and Southern Pacific, all four of which are without question among the outstanding roads of the country. Under Mr. Harriman, the Union and Southern Pacific systems, which were practically bankrupt at the time he took them over, were developed into wonderful properties physically by the investment of millions in roadbed and equipment. Today, the Union Pacific is so prosperous that it has been said it could stop running its trains entirely and still continue to pay the interest on its funded debt out of the earnings from outside investments. We can multiply details of this character, but in a treatise of this kind, it is possible only to draw outlines of strength and weakness. The past history of any of these properties must be studied in detail really to understand the situation in regard to each company. End of section 2 Read by Elsie Selwyn. Section 3 of Railroads from the Investor's Viewpoint by the Federal Securities Corporation. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recent History, Part 1. 2. Recent History, Situation During the World War. This brings our story down to the time that the United States entered the war. We are all more or less familiar with the problems which the railroads were asked to face at that time. We know of the labor situation and the increasing scale of prices which confronted railroads in 1917 as a result of the World War in Europe. Traffic, of course, had been tremendous during 1916, which was one of the most prosperous years in the annals of railroad history of the United States. This prosperity continued during the early part of 1917, but the situation changed at the time of our entry into the war. Notwithstanding the large volume of traffic which the roads were carrying, the railroad situation, due to the rising costs of labor, of material, and of money, in the spring of 1917 became acute. There was a large shortage of equipment of all kinds due to the heavy traffic, as well as an insufficient and inefficient labor supply at high costs. As a result, the margin of net earnings showed a declining tendency, and there appeared to be an impending demoralization of railroad credit. In addition, the political attitude toward the railroads was most uncertain, a condition that added further perplexities to the situation. The net result was that during the nine months of war preceding government operation of the railroads, the situation was uncertain and critical. It was recognized by the government, the railroad companies, and the public at large that, upon our entrance into the war, the interests of the railroad companies should be made subservient to the general welfare of the country and to the plan of moving all things toward a favorable termination of the war as early as possible. The companies voluntarily surrendered their individual initiative and independence because it seemed necessary as a war measure, but in doing so floundered about in a sea of irresponsible and inexperienced centralized direction and were given little or no assurance of financial or corporate independence. We all know that under this system the difficulties of operation multiplied to an extent that made government operation not only a military necessity for the country, but a financial necessity for the roads. 
It is said that private operation under military necessity could hardly have been continued without at least financial demoralization of the roads and perhaps general bankruptcy. True, it was recognized that the taking over the railroads of the country by the government would be attended with certain serious evils. It was recognized that it might result in laxity of executive direction, in inefficiency of operation on the part of labor, an increased cost of operation with decreasing earnings, as well as in deterioration of equipment and roadbed. All of these things we know actually did result from government control, and yet it was probably the only course which could have been pursued from the standpoint of the good of the country and the good of the roads as a whole. Federal Operation The roads were taken over by the government on January 1, 1918. They were rented by the government at a rental which amounted to the average net operating earnings of each road for the three years preceding government control. The year 1915 was not a very good year for the roads. 1916, on the other hand, was one of the best years they had ever had. 1917 was an average year. An average of the net earnings of all three years was considered to be a very fair allowance for the roads during the period of government control. A contract to this effect was made by the government with each railroad separately and individually. There were some cases where this general arrangement seemed to be unfair to the roads, as in the case of the Western Pacific, which had just gone through receivership and had had practically no net earnings during the three years previous to government control. In situations like this, where the railroad objected to the plan of government rental, the cases were taken up by a referee and decided individually. The period during government control can probably be passed over very quickly because the results of such operation are more or less fresh in our minds. It was necessary for the government, of course, to have absolute control of traffic, to give preference to shipment of troops and of war materials, and to make the interest of shippers secondary. Traffic was diverted from customary channels, certain roads were asked to take care of an unusually heavy density of traffic, on others, the traffic was lighter than under ordinary conditions. This could not but result in inefficiencies of operation by reason of congestion of traffic in certain spots and thinness in certain others. One unfortunate result was that because a road had no responsibility, it was not as particular as formerly in getting foreign cars out of its hands and back to the owning railroad. The roads were under-equipped and the equipment under-maintained. When the railroads were taken over, the freight cars and other equipment generally were in poor condition because of the universal labor shortage. Because of the carpooling arrangement under government control, there was little incentive for operating officials to keep their cars in repair since only a small percentage of each company's cars would remain on its own line. This situation could not but contribute to a general freight car and passenger car deterioration, especially since, under pressure, Cars and locomotives were often kept on the rails when they should have been in the repair shops. Moreover, during the 26 months of government control, only 100,000 new freight cars and 1,900 new locomotives were ordered and put into use. Prior to federal control, the average production of freight cars each 12 months had been 100,000, so that there was a greater shortage of car equipment at the end of federal control than at the beginning. Moreover, all costs, as everyone no doubt remembers, including labor and materials, were increased tremendously during the period of the war, whereas freight rates were increased almost not at all until the war was practically over. The total rental which it was necessary for the government to pay in each year amounted to about $950 million. In 1919, when the net operating income of the railroads was less than $550 million, the loss to the government in operating the roads was over $400 million. The final result, according to the report of Director General Hines made to President Wilson on February 28, 1920, was that this was an excess of operating expenses and rentals over operating revenue for 26 months, amounting to $715,500,000. We mention this merely to show the tremendous increases in labor and operating costs to the railroad companies without corresponding increases in rates. The roads were in government hands for 26 months. On March 1, 1920, at the time they were turned back to private ownership, 
Director General Hines of the Railroad Administration issued a statement in which he briefly analyzed the operation under government control. He said he knew the government had been severely criticized because of the deficit which had been incurred, but he pointed out that the cost of transportation had to be paid in one way or another, and that it was exactly the same whether the money was taken out of the people in the form of taxes or in the form of increased freight rates. As it was, the medium of taxation was chosen because of the unsettling effect large increases in freight rates would have had on business generally. It was necessary that all business should go forward as smoothly as possible because of the great need for manufactured articles of all kinds during and because of the war. It did not seem politic to increase freight rates, but since the increased costs of labor and of materials increased costs of operation to the point of a deficit, it became necessary to make up the deficit in the form of taxes. In justification of his position, Director Hines drew an analogy between the history of the operation of the railroads during the war and the history of the operation of the United States Steel Corporation. The steel company's operating costs from 1914 to 1918 increased 150%, whereas the operating costs of the railroads increased 102%. The cost per unit, moreover, of the steel company's product increased 61%, whereas the railroad's cost per unit of traffic increased 60%. Mr. Hines further pointed out that certain situations, over which he had no control, greatly increased the cost of transportation for the government. For example, the increase in rates granted in June of 1918 should have been granted long before that time. If it had been granted in January instead, the net advantage to the roads would have been about $494 million. Again, we all remember the coal strike which took place in the fall of 1919, the results of which were not chargeable to the government, but which cost the government $114 million net in operating the carriers. Further than this, the deficit of about $400 million, which occurred in operating the railroads in 1919, was in very large part occasioned by the extraordinary slump in freight business in the first six months of that year. Mr. Hines estimated the deficit in these six months at $292,500,000, as against a total deficit for the year of about $400 million. The deficit during the first six months is not properly chargeable to government operation because the war was over and the slump in traffic would have been there just the same, whether the roads themselves or the government were operating the carriers. All told, while the operation of the roads by the government was a costly procedure, it would seem that under the circumstances, results were as good as could have been expected. Under wartime conditions, it was necessary that the public generally should pay for the cost of forced transportation under trying conditions, and the method chosen to make this payment was probably just as good as, if not better than, any other that was possible. Individual Showings During Government Control It is very interesting to study the results of the various railroad companies during the 26 months of government control, because it is a pertinent indication of the strength and earning capacity of the various properties. A road must not be judged, of course, on this showing alone, because, in the case of many, influences over which the managers of the property had no control tended toward a poor showing. However, those roads which, in spite of generally increased costs, and in spite of inadequate increases in freight rates, were able to earn amounts equal to or even exceeding the amounts of the government rental, are clearly shown to be strong properties, at least during the period of government control. The fact that during 1918 and 1919, both the Atchison and Union Pacific earned amounts greater than the government rental is a most interesting commentary on the financial strength of these two systems. The Michigan Central also is in this class, as well as the Nickel Plate, the Pier Marquette, and the Big Four. The Oregon Short Line, which is really part of the Union Pacific, also in both years earned more than its guarantee. The Western Pacific, too, falls into this class, probably only because it had just passed through a receivership period of small earnings. The Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western, the Chesapeake and Ohio, the Atlantic Coastline, the Louisville and Nashville, the Southern, the St. Louis and San Francisco, and the St. Louis Southwestern were among the roads which earned more than their guarantee in one of the two years. The southern roads generally made a very good showing because of the fact that the army camps were located in the south, occasioning a large increase in traffic during those years. 
The New York Central earned almost its guarantee during both years, but made a better showing in 1919 than in 1918. The Norfolk and Western also made a good showing in both years. The Chicago, Burlington and Quincy, the Southern Pacific, the Northern Pacific, the Rock Island, the Denver and Rio Grande, as well as the Kansas City Southern and Texas and Pacific fall into the same group of roads which made a very good showing but fell short of earning their guarantee during two years. On the other hand, certain roads which one would ordinarily expect to make a better showing did rather poorly. The Illinois Central earned $12,900,000 in 1918 and only $4,000,000 in 1919, as compared with a government guarantee of $16,000,000. The Great Northern earned about $12,000,000 in both years, as compared with a government guarantee of over $28,000,000. The Chicago and Northwestern similarly earned about $12 million each year as compared with a rental of over $23 million. The Philadelphia and Reading, which also is a strong road and should be classed with the others just mentioned, earned $11 million in 1918, and only $5 million in 1919 as compared with a guarantee of over $17 million. It is not surprising, of course, that the New England roads did not do very well. The New Haven, with a standard return of about $17 million, earned $7,700,000 in 1918 and $6,900,000 in 1919. The Boston and Maine earned $1,895,000 in 1918 and $3,577,000 in 1919, compared with a rental of $9,832,000. The Boston and Albany earned about half its guarantee, and the main central showed a deficit in both years. The Delaware and Hudson and the Lehigh Valley, both of which are anthracite roads, and which might be expected to make a good showing, did relatively quite poorly. The central of New Jersey, also an anthracite road, made a fair showing in 1918 with net earnings of $6 million, but in 1919 fell off with earnings of only $1,400,000, as compared with a guarantee of over $9 million. The Pennsylvania lines, both east and west, did not show very well during the war. The eastern lines were guaranteed $51 million net, whereas in 1918 the earnings were only about $19,900,000 and in 1919 a little over $8 million. The lines west of Pittsburgh showed $4,400,000 net in 1918 and $5,700,000 in 1919 compared with a $14 million guarantee. It is not surprising, of course, that roads like the Wabash, the Chicago Great Western, the Seaboard Airline, and the Missouri Pacific should not do as well as some of the other roads, but the poor showing of the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul is probably the greatest surprise of all. This road earned only $3,900,000 in 1918 and $3,200,000 in 1919 as compared with a government guarantee of almost $27,900,000. The Transportation Act. On March 1, 1920, as we have previously mentioned, the roads were turned back to their original owners. Mr. Wilson in 1919 had promised that he would turn the roads over to their owners on January 1st, 1920. He frankly said that he did not know how this was to be done, but he hoped that certain legislation would be put through by Congress so that this might be effected. A railroad bill had been in preparation in the House, as a matter of fact, by Mr. John J. Esch of Wisconsin and in the Senate by Mr. Cummings of Iowa. The problem resolved itself into effecting a compromise between the two bills, and during the first week in February, the conferees came to an agreement. On February 18th, the bill was completed in conference, and the legislation proposed by the conferees was reported to the Senate and to the House, passed, and finally signed on February 28th, 1920. The bill, as it is now in operation, contains the following provisions. 1. Freight and passenger rates so to be adjusted by the Interstate Commerce Commission as to yield the carriers for the two-year period beginning March 1, 1920, a return of 
on the aggregate value of railroad property with permission on the part of the Interstate Commerce Commission to make this allowed return 6%, the additional one half of 1% to be used for non-productive maintenance, betterments, and equipment. Two, one half of a railroad's net operating income in excess of 6% of its property value to be distributed equally between the road's reserve fund and the Federal Railroad Contingent Fund, the latter to be administered by the Commission for the Assistance of Weaker Roads. 3. The government to continue its guarantee of standard return to all the roads for six months after the date of resumption of private operation up to September 1, 1920, Rates and fares, as well as wages, not to be reduced prior to that date without the consent of the Interstate Commerce Commission. 4. Permission to be granted to consolidate the railroads of the country in accordance with a general consolidation plan to be prepared by the Interstate Commerce Commission. 5. All labor disputes to be submitted to a permanent federal board appointed by the President to be composed of nine members, three representing the employees, three representing the railroads, and three representing the public. 6. $300 million to be appropriated as a revolving fund for the purpose of making loans to the railroads and of paying claims to them on account of disputes arising out of federal control, the railroads to pay interest on the money so loaned at the rate of 6%. The bill originally provided that this was to be paid back in five years, but on June 5, 1920, by amendment, the time was extended to 15 years. It will be seen that by the provisions of this bill, each road was guaranteed for six months a return equal to that which it received under government control. After September 1, 1920, the bill did not guarantee any return whatsoever. It merely authorized the Interstate Commerce Commission to regulate rates and fares by geographical districts in such a way as to yield 5.5% on the aggregate fair value of all the railroad property investment in each district. The Interstate Commerce Commission has divided the country into four districts, the Eastern, the Southern, the Mountain Pacific, and the Western districts. In a general way, the Eastern District includes the railroads north of the Ohio River and east of the Mississippi River. The Southern District includes those roads south of the Ohio River and east of the Mississippi. The Western District is the area west of the Mississippi and east of an irregular line drawn through what is called the Denver Points while the Mountain Pacific District includes those roads west of the Western District to the Pacific Coast. Each of these districts contains weak as well as strong roads, but the bill does not mean that each road, strong or weak, is guaranteed 5.5% on its value as determined by the Commission. It means that rates should be so adjusted that the return will be 5.5% on the aggregate property value of all the railroads in each district. This would probably mean more than 5.5% for the strong roads and less than that for the weak. After 6% has been earned by a railroad upon its fair value without regard for other income, the excess over this amount shall be divided between the railroad which earned the excess and the railroad contingent fund. This fund is to be used either for making loans to the carriers or for the purchase of equipment to be leased to the carriers. In either case, the government is to receive from the railroad 6% on the amount so invested. The railroad's share of the surplus above 6% of the property value is to be placed in a trust fund for the purpose of building up a surplus for the road until this fund equals 5% of the property value of any particular carrier, after which the road is privileged to use it for any purpose it desires. This fund may be used for making up interest or dividends during those years when the carrier's earnings are less than the required amount. Private Operation Such was the situation when, on March 1st, the railroads were turned over to their private owners. Under government ownership, it is said that the railroad expenses increased over $1.5 billion a year. Whatever the amount was, the roads were left with a real legacy of enormously increased expenses, with properties that were in poorer shape than when they were turned over, and with less, and in many cases much poorer, equipment. The railroads were faced with the serious problem of meeting the situation of poor condition of roadbed and equipment, with expenses and labor costs constantly increasing. The employees during the first six months of private operation were negotiating for higher wages. 
On April 16th, the first meeting of the Labor Board under the Transportation Act was called, and on July 20th, this board announced at Chicago that wage increases had been awarded, which it was estimated at the time would add $600 million to the operating expenses of the roads. While these negotiations were going on, the roads themselves were negotiating for increased rates, and on May 24th, hearings were opened by the Interstate Commerce Commission. On July 29th, the Interstate Commerce Commission granted the railroads increases in freight and passenger rates, which it was then estimated would yield about $1.5 billion additional revenue per year to the carriers, the new rates to become effective on August 26th. Under the decision of the commission, the roads in the Eastern District were authorized to increase their freight rates 40%, those in the Southern and Mountain Pacific Districts 25%, and those in the Western District, 35%. The Commission also authorized the carriers to advance passenger rates 20%, Pullman rates 50%, and excess baggage and milk rates 20%. Rate Increases The report of the Commission at the time these rate increases were authorized is a very interesting document. The problem which was presented to them was to fix rates for the railroads in the different groups at such a figure that for the two-year period ending March 1, 1922, they would yield at least 5.5% on the fair value of the aggregate physical property of the roads in a given district. The first thing to ascertain and establish, therefore, was the aggregate value of the railway property of the carriers held and used in the service of transportation. The valuation work of the railroads under the Interstate Commerce Commission Act was still incomplete, but the work had progressed so far that the results were of great value in reaching the determination which the Commission needed as a basis. From the valuations which had been made and other evidence which was submitted, as well as information which the Commission had obtained, the Commission determined that the total value of the steam railway property for their purpose was approximately $18.9 billion divided as follows. Eastern Group, $8.8 billion. Southern Group, $2 billion. Western and Mountain Pacific Group, $8.1 billion. The carriers themselves asked for rates which capitalized on the basis of a 6% return, which would make the value of the properties in excess of $20.5 billion, and they actually carried the cost of road and equipment on their books at a figure in excess of $20 billion. The Eastern carriers asked that they be permitted to earn an annual net railway operating income of $559,409,933, which would represent 6% on the book cost of $9,323,498,898. The figures for 1919 showed that the rates in effect at the time the investigation was going on would fall short $500 million annually of earnings earning the net railway operating income to which they claimed they were entitled. The Commission recognized that not only had there been a sharp decline in railway operating income during the previous three or four years, but also that the operating ratio had increased at, quote, a rate that causes serious concern, end quote. For the five years prior to 1916, the operating ratio of the eastern carriers was 71%. This had increased to 75% in 1917, to almost 86% in 1918, to 88.5% in 1919, and 97.68% in the first four months of 1920. This means that during the first four months of 1920, after paying operating expenses, there was left only 2.32 cents out of each dollar for the payment of interest on funded debt, taxes, and other items such as rents, hire of equipment, leases, etc., and short for the payment of fixed charges. During the six-year period beginning with 1912, it took approximately 28.79 cents out of every dollar of operating revenue to pay these fixed charges, so that the need of the eastern carriers for an increase in rates was immediately apparent. In addition to the above, it will be recalled that in July 1920, the Labor Board placed in effect a general increase in wages, which it was estimated would add approximately $314,500,000 annually to the operating expenses of the carriers in the Eastern Group. This entire situation, in the opinion of the Commission, could be met by a 40% increase in freight rates and by the other increases previously rehearsed.
In the Southern group as a whole, the situation was much more favorable. The carriers in this group asked that their rates be increased so that they might earn net $136,049,091, which represents a return of 6% on a value of $2,267,484,847. The roads in the Southern Group estimated that under the schedule of rates in effect at the beginning of 1920, their operating income would be approximately $120 million less than this sum. The operating expenses in this group had, like those in the Eastern District, increased heavily, but not to the same extent. During the six years ended 1917, the operating ratio of the Southern carriers varied from 65% in 1916 to 74% in 1914. In 1918, it was 77 and two-thirds percent. In 1919, it had advanced to 86%, and for the first four months of 1920, was 86.22%. The roads in this group asked for an increase of approximately 31% in freight revenue and reached an advance of 25% in freight together with the general advance in passenger and Pullman rates previously outlined. In the Western and Mountain Pacific groups, the carriers requested that their rates be fixed on a basis to permit them to earn $537,833,024, which represents a 6% return on $8,963,883,753. On the basis of the prediction of the carriers, the operating income of these districts would fall short approximately $350 million of the amount to which they believed they were entitled. The operating ratio of the roads in these groups had increased similarly with those in the other two groups. This ratio, which between 1912 and 1917 had ranged from 63% to 68%, had advanced to 81% in 1919, and to 86.6% for the first four months of 1920. And taking the various figures of the roads in this group and adjusting them to the standard set by the Interstate Commerce Commission, it was determined that the return stipulated under the Ash Cummings Bill could be earned through an increase for the Western Group of 35% in freight rates and for the Mountain Pacific Group of 25%, together with the general increases in passenger and other rates. In the opinion of the Interstate Commerce Commission, these increases in rates, both freight and passenger, would yield at least 5.5% on the total valuation of the railroads of the country as determined by them. In this connection, it is very interesting to note that the aggregate valuation the Commission placed on the properties not only covers all of the funded debt of the railroads at par, but also covers all the capital stock of the railroads at par and leaves a margin of about $2 billion besides. In other words, in the opinion of the Commission, the roads are today conservatively worth $2 billion more than their entire capitalization. End of Section 3. Read by Elsie Selwyn. Section 4 of Railroads from the Investor's Viewpoint by the Federal Securities Corporation. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recent History, Part 2. Results under private operation. The law says the roads are entitled to earn 5.5% to 6% on this valuation or between $1,039,500,000 and $1,134,000,000. There seems to be a misconception, not so much on the part of the investing public, but rather on the part of the general public, about the Transportation Act. It seems popularly to be supposed that under the terms of the Act, the government guarantees 5.5% to 6% on the railroad investment. The Transportation Act says that rates shall be so arranged as to allow the roads to earn a net profit of between 5.5% and 6% on the aggregate property value, but the government does not guarantee this profit. The Interstate Commerce Commission itself can only guess as to whether the rates it fixes will produce the adequate profit. It can only control rates, it cannot control volume of traffic, nor price of material, of money, or of labor. As a matter of fact, it has no assurances as to labor costs, as wages are fixed by the Federal Labor Board without consultation with the Interstate Commerce Commission. Much, of course, depends on the efficiency of the railroads themselves, and we all know that the efficiency of the railroads was greatly increased during the first year of private operation. 
When the roads were turned back to their original owners, most of the operators began immediately to improve and rehabilitate their properties, as well as to increase efficiency all along the line. The carriers during the first year of operation for their own account spent millions of dollars on roadbeds and terminals. We have previously mentioned how equipment was neglected during the period of the war and how new equipment necessary to the efficient operation of the roads was not added when needed. The fact that $125 million of the $300 million revolving fund authorized by the Transportation Act was allotted for the purchase of equipment shows the need of the roads in this respect. Many of the carriers in 1921 purchased new equipment financed through equipment trust obligations, sold to the public, and most of them showed increased efficiency in the use of the old equipment available. As a matter of fact, the first six months of private operation, during which the government guarantee was in force, were dedicated to increasing the efficiency of the roads, to show what was accomplished. The tonnage per freight car was increased from 28.3 tons on March 1, 1920 to 29.8 tons on September 1st. This does not seem a large gain, but put in terms of freight cars, it means the equivalent of adding 100,000 freight cars to the equipment of the systems. The average mileage per day was also increased from 22.3 on March 1st, 1920 to 27.4 on September 1st, 1920, a gain which is equivalent to 400,000 freight cars. The number of cars loaded also showed a great increase, and the number of tons moved one mile during the first six months of 1920 were 3 billion tons more than during the first 10 months of 1918, which was a record year in the midst of the war. During the year after the termination of federal control, the roads moved 9 billion ton miles more than in 1918 employing the same facilities. These latter figures did not continue in force during 1921 when traffic slumped, but they are illustrative of the genuine effort the roads made toward efficiency and the splendid results accomplished. In spite of these efficiencies and economies, the railroads did not earn anywhere near their 5.5% to 6% return for 1920, nor did they do so in 1921. In 1920, the net income of the railroads was only $62 million. Had the government not guaranteed the standard return up to September 1st, there would have been a deficit in railroad operation of roundly $2 billion. As it was, the $62 million net was asked to pay interest charges of about $450 million. By comparison, we may mention that in 1916, the roads earned net $1 billion, $40 million, which was $240 million more than dividend requirements. During the first five months of operation under the new rates, that is September 1920 to January 1921, inclusive, with a volume of business that was considered large enough to produce the standard 5.5%, the roads as a whole earned only 3%. For the first six months of 1921, the net revenue amounted to $142 billion. This was about one quarter of what the law entitled the roads to earn, and was $95 million short of enough to pay six months' interest on the bonds of the companies. From September 1, 1920, when the guarantee period ended, to June 30, 1921, the roads earned net $368,445,000, or at the rate of about 2.5%. For eight months of 1921, ended August 31st, the roads failed to earn the authorized 6% by over $692 million, and again earned only 2.6% on the aggregate valuation. The figures show that during the first 12 months of operation under private ownership, that is up to September 1st, 1921, the roads earned a smaller return on the book cost of their road and equipment than in any year since railway statistics were kept. The amount earned in this 12 months was less than 3% of the aggregate value. The smallest return in any previous year of which there is a record is 1894 when 3.2% was earned. However, earnings improved from month to month, and during August 1921, the roads for the first time earned at the rate of 5.5% on the aggregate value, the net earnings in this month being over $90 million. Reasons for Curtailed Earnings 
Why then, if the roads increased their efficiency so greatly, did they fail to earn their stipulated return in the face of the very generous increases in rates granted in August 1920? The reasons were three. One, there was a great slump in business in 1921 and consequently in the volume of traffic handled by the roads. Two, the rates of increase, while generous, were still not large enough to produce the required revenue. Three, the operating costs of the roads had been tremendously increased. The slump in business we have all felt and remember. In the early part of 1921, the slump was at its height, but as the year went along, traffic seemed to pick up and earnings grew better. Earnings are an indication of this. In February, there was an actual deficit of $7 million in operation, while in September, the roads reported net earnings of over $90 million. To illustrate, in July, traffic had already begun to quicken materially, as indicated in the results in terms of net earnings, but even so, the number of cars loaded in four weeks in July was 2,981,106, as compared with 3,559,081 during the same weeks of 1920 and 3,365,049 for the same weeks of 1919. An analysis of the car loadings is interesting as indicating which particular kinds of traffic showed the greatest falling off. It is a peculiar fact that the shipments of agricultural products, of grain, and of merchandise, especially the higher grades of manufactured products, were very large and in some instances greater in 1921 than in 1920 or 1919. On the other hand, shipments of bulkier materials were unprecedentedly small, namely coal, iron ore, forest products, lime, cement, etc., when we consider what a large part of the traffic of the roads is always made up of the bulky products of mines and forests, it is easy to understand the great falling off of traffic in the first half of 1921. Coal itself ordinarily constitutes 35% of the total tonnage of the roads. The coal situation was unprecedented. From December 1920, when the coal shipment situation was about normal, to May 1921, in the short space of five months, the tonnage of coal shipped per day was almost cut in two. In fact, never have the coal shipments been relatively as small as they were in the first part of 1921. The years 1914 and 1915, like 1921, were years of business depression. Since then, the population of the country has increased, and the needs of manufacture have greatly increased. And yet, in the first seven months of 1921, the shipments of bituminous coal were 12 million tons less than in 1914, and 2 million less than in 1915. In a comparison with 1919, we find a falling off of 29 million tons, and with 1918, of 110 million tons, for the seven-month period from January to July. We have said that one reason for the failure of the roads to earn their 5.5% was that the increases in rates, while generous, were not large enough, nor were they properly timed. Since 1915, there have been four general increases in rates, 3.7% in January 1917, 2% in March 1918, 25% in June 1919, and an average of 34% in August 1920. The total increase was 78%. Operating expenses in the same period increased from $2,055,181,884 for the fiscal year ended June 30, 1915, to $5,830,696,007 for the calendar year 1920. Even considering the expenses for the calendar year 1915 as $2,250,000,000, which would be very generous, the increase in operating expenses was over 150% in the six-year period as compared with a 78% increase in freight rates. The increase, of course, was all that business would stand, but the point is that it was not enough to permit the roads to earn 5.5% on their book values. The railroads also point out that if the rates had been gradually advanced from time to time since 1915, the shock to business would not have been so great and the returns to the roads larger and steadier. Increase in operating costs. Few people seem to realize how tremendously the operating costs of the railroads have increased in recent years. 
a few general statements will emphasize the startling truth. We have said that the operating costs increased over 150% from 1915 to 1920. In 1918, the operating expenses were greater than the total operating revenue from 1917, with about the same volume of traffic. The labor cost in 1920 was greater than the entire gross operating revenue in 1916, again with about the same volume of traffic. The labor cost itself had advanced from $1,190,000,000 in 1915 to $3,698,000,000 in 1920, or much more than trebled. Material costs advanced from $447 million in 1915 to $1,064,000,000 in 1920. Material costs have been usually from one-fourth to one-third as great as labor costs, yet the material costs of 1920 were almost identical with the labor costs of 1915. It is rather startling that in 1920 the net earnings left after operating expenses were only 1% out of total operating revenues of $6,171,000,000 as against 28.9% in 1916 from gross operating revenues of $3,596,000,000. Labor Cost The labor cost is the one over which the most discussion and conflict has occurred. There has been in the past, and probably will continue to be, a wide divergence of opinion as to how the labor question should be adjusted. The Transportation Act provides that boards of labor adjustment might be local to a railroad, might be regional, or might be national in jurisdiction. Managers of the roads have always felt that they themselves should deal with their own employees by means of local boards. The railroad men on their part insist that the boards be national and that the power be centralized. The roads naturally have fought wage increases in view of mounting costs, while the employees have resented decreases. The labor problem of the roads can best be illustrated by showing what percentage of each dollar earned during various years was paid out for the most important items of expense, and what percentage was left the roads as return on the investment. Thus. In 1916, labor was 40.8%, fuel 7%, materials 12.5%, and the return on investment was 28.9%. In 1917, labor was 43.3%, fuel 9.8%, materials 12.2%, and the return on investment was 23.3%. In 1918, labor was 53.6%, fuel 10.2%, materials 13.1%, and the return on investment was 13.1%. In 1919, labor was 55.3%, fuel 9.2%, materials 15.6%, and the return on investment was 8.8%. In 1920, labor was 59.9%, fuel 10.9%, materials 17.3%, and the return on investment was 1%. The minor items are omitted in the above table, which shows that in 1920 about 60% of the total gross revenue of the roads was paid in wages as against 41% in 1916. The following figures show the yearly average wage of railroad employees. In 1916, $892, in 1917, $1,004, in 1918, $1,419, in 1919, $1,482. In 1920, $1,908. The wage per man has more than doubled. Moreover, in 1917, the last year the roads were operated privately during the war, the average number of employees was 1,732,876. In 1920, when the roads were turned back, the average number of employees was 1,993,524 a gain of 260,000 employees during the period of government control. The Rhodes contend that this increase in the number of men was occasioned by the national agreements with their very costly labor arrangements. These special arrangements, which the managers were forced to accept when the roads were turned back to private operation, are said to have added $300 million to the annual operating costs of the properties. The best way to visualize the gradual decrease in net income and the increase in labor costs is to show the figures. In 1916, the gross revenue was $3,597,000,000. In 1920, 
the labor cost $1,468,000,000, the net income $1,040,000,000, with a return of 6.16%. In 1917, gross revenue was $4,014,000,000, the labor cost $1,739,000,000, net income $934,000,000, with a return of 5.26%. In 1918, the gross revenue was $4,881,000,000, labor cost $2,613,000,000, net income $639,000,000, with a return of 3.51%. In 1919, the gross revenue was $5,145,000,000, a labor cost of $2,843,000,000, a net income of $455 million, with a return of 2.46%. In 1920, the gross revenue was $6,171,000,000,000, the labor cost $3,698,000,000,000, a net income of $62,000,000,000, with a return of 0.32%. This shows that the labor cost for 1920 was greater than the total gross revenue for 1916. The 1919 labor cost was just about equal to the 1917 total operating expense. Again, the 1918 total operating expense was less than $400 million more than the 1920 labor cost. The wage increase put in effect in July 1920 was an average increase of 22% in wages. It was estimated it would add $600 million to the expenses of the roads. The wage decrease put into effect on July 1, 1921 was an average decrease of 12%. It was estimated to reduce operating expenses by $400 million, while the abrogation of the national agreements was estimated to reduce the amount another $300 million when effective. The employees resented the cut in wages, and when further reductions were asked for by the roads with a disposition on the part of the Federal Labor Board to grant them, the employees in October 1921 threatened a nationwide strike which was averted only by federal interference. The employees, however, recognized that a cut in wages was not only inevitable, but imperative. The managers on their part recognized that a reduction in freight rates was also essential. In fact, at the time of the threatened strike, a bulletin of the Association of Railway Executives stated, quote, It is evident that existing transportation charges bear, in many cases, a disproportionate relationship to the prices at which commodities can be sold in the market, and that existing labor and other costs of transportation thus impose upon industry and agriculture generally a burden greater than they should bear. This is especially true of agriculture. The railroad managements are sensitive to and sympathetic with the distressing situation and desire to do everything to assist in relieving it that is compatible with their duty to furnish the transportation which the public must have." End quote. In November 1921, the Interstate Commerce Commission proposed, and the roads accepted, a 10% decrease in the rates on agricultural products, effective about January 1, 1922. Other decreases must follow as decreases in wages, materials, and money occur. It should be borne in mind that a 15% reduction in operating expenses based on 1920 figures means $875 million annually to the roads. A 20% reduction means $1,160,000,000 or the equivalent of 6% in the total aggregate value of the properties. This does not seem so hopeless as some were pleased to think during the early part of 1921. In fact, it is not hopeless at all, it is very probable indeed. Improvement in Conditions The situation grew stronger month by month almost continuously during 1921. The government on its part strengthened and clarified its position greatly during the year by the sale of a considerable portion of the equipment trust obligations it owned, as well as by settling a large number of the claims of the carriers against the government as a result of federal operation. Up to October, practically $100 million of the 6% equipment trust obligations owned by the government had been sold to financial houses, who had in turn resold them to the public. 
The government originally had about $380 million of these equipment trust obligations, and it is only a question of time when the balance will be marketed. With respect to settlement of carriers' claims, as much progress has been made. Up to October 1st, sundry claims aggregating $856 million, growing out of federal operation, had been filed for final settlement. These claims represented about 78% of the total mileage under government control, and, therefore, the total amount of claims was expected to reach something over $1 billion. Up to October 1, 1921, claims aggregating $387 million, or almost half of the amount filed up to that time, had been finally adjusted and paid. The amount of the government allowances on these claims was $117,715,000, or about 30% of the amount claimed. The progress of the roads themselves has been very evident in the reports of the net earnings from month to month. It will be recalled that during January and February of 1921, the roads earned a deficit in each month. From March to August inclusive, the operating results have been as follows. March, operating revenue of $459,262,510. Operating expenses, $400,429,308, with a net income of $30,695,192. In April, the operating revenue was $433,357,199. Operating expenses, $375,698,986, with a net income of $29,248,874. In May, the operating revenue was $444,875,089. Operating expenses, $380,041,234, with a net income of $37,080,654. In June, the operating revenue was $461,562,317. The operating expenses, $380,927,429, with a net income of $51,641,014. In July, the operating revenue was $462,849,446. The operating expenses, $362,841,183. With a net income of $69,298,521. In August, the operating revenue was $505,508,274. Operating expenses $382,279,070. With a net income of $90,241,103. Three tendencies are at once apparent from an examination of these figures. One, the tendency of the gross revenues to increase from month to month, showing a slight increase in volume of traffic. Two, the tendency of the operating expenses to decrease, at least in percentage of gross, indicating either increased efficiency or decreased maintenance, or both. And three, the tendency of the net income to increase, showing a tendency to approach the level where 5.5% to 6% of the property values will be earned. In August 1921, the $90 million of net earnings was at the annual rate of a little over 5.5% on the property value of $18,900,000,000 allowed by the commission. In September, the net had fallen slightly to about $87 million, but still at the rate of 5.5%. Increased Efficiency and Increased Business As indicated in the above figures, the increase in net earnings from month to month has been due to two causes. One, increased efficiency in operation and decreased maintenance, and two, increased business from month to month. The decline in material prices has also had its influence, and the wage reduction has been a big factor in the months since July. In the matter of maintenance, the roads report that they spent $373 million less for maintenance for the first eight months of 1921 than they did in the same period of 1920. 
Had the maintenance been the same for 1921 as for 1920, instead of realizing a net operating income of over $303 million for eight months, there would have been an actual deficit of over $70 million. During September of 1921, the gross operating revenues were 19.6% less than during September 1920, while operating expenses were 26% smaller. Expenditures on maintenance for September 1921 showed a decrease of 23.3%, but slightly larger than in August. This reduction represents a postponement of outlay until conditions improve, rather than an actual saving. It has been only by the most rigid economies that the roads were able to make the showings registered. That the roads had a better hold on their expenditures is indicated in the fact that in June 1921, 82.34 cents out of every dollar of revenue went for expenses, compared with 85.43 cents in May. In June 1920, the figure was 96.84 cents, and in May 1920, 95.69 cents. In July 1921, the operating ratio had fallen to 78% and in August 1921 to about 75%. We have already detailed earlier how during 1920, the roads had increased the average movement per car per day as well as the average tonnage per car and the average number of cars per train. By buying on a hand-to-mouth basis, especially coal, and by intensive efforts to reduce coal and material consumption, as well as by cutting the number of employees down to the very minimum, considerable additional savings in operation were affected. In reaching the low ratios of operation for August and September 1921, not only were the economies of operation and the retrenchment and maintenance operative, but the reduction in wages and the increase in traffic had their contributing influence. Traffic was on the upturn from month to month during 1921, as reflected in the figures of gross revenues and in the car loading reports. The tendency during the entire year 1921 has been toward an increase in the volume of traffic in grain and general merchandise. But against an increase in the movement of the heavier products of mines, such as coal and ore, the backbone of freight traffic. From month to month, the freight car loadings have shown increases and the idle car figures decreases. A few figures chosen at random will be of interest. For the week ending July 30, 1921, the freight loadings totaled 796,570 cars, an increase of 6,222 cars over the previous week. Again, the week of August 30th, 1921, showed a gain of 7,471 cars over the previous week. The total for the week of August 30th was 816,436 cars, a gain of about 20,000 cars in a month. In one week of September 1921, the loadings were 830,603 cars, while in the corresponding week of October, the number of car loadings had increased to 901,078, or an approach to 1920 levels. In one month from August 1921 to September 1921, the idle cars decreased from 513,040 to 237,972, a reduction of over 50%. Present Situation and Future Problems the situation is improving and will gradually straighten itself out. Problems of moment are still ahead of the roads, the administration, the labor board, and the Interstate Commerce Commission, but every day progress is being made towards settlement of a situation that in the early part of 1921 seemed exceedingly difficult of solution. The future must solve other problems. In March 1922, for example, the first two-year period of operation under private control will have ended and it will be up to Congress and the Interstate Commerce Commission to make new regulations or to continue in effect the ones now operative. But this should not concern us. The solution of the railroad difficulty always has been and always will be found. The roads are too vital a part of our life and prosperity for any other result ever to come about. Positive influences are daily working in this direction. Before Congress at this time, for example, is the funding plan which is strongly being urged by President Harding as a contributing force to the solution of the railroad problems. 
The Interstate Commerce Commission, in accordance with the provision of the Transportation Act, is studying the possibility of consolidations among the roads and has invited reports of experts on this very important question. Consolidation of the weaker systems with the stronger cannot help but fortify the whole fabric. However complex the situation may be at this time, it would seem to us that the railroad companies are today in a much stronger position than they have been probably at any time in their history. They are operating under a law which should in time assure the average road annually 5.5% net on its property valuation. The general situation in the industry is strengthened because the basic principles on which the roads are working are more firmly established. The trying conditions of today and tomorrow are transient and will pass, but the basic principles of operation of the roads will remain to control continued prosperity over a long period of time. However, while this is true and while the railroads as a whole are in a stronger situation fundamentally than they have been in the past, the comparative relationships between the different properties will probably continue as before. What we mean to say is that just as in the past there have been strong roads, average roads, and weak roads, so in the future the various systems will fall in much the same classifications. The earning power and prosperity of any individual road will in the future depend on much the same factors as heretofore, namely conservatism and capitalization, degree of upkeep of property, and efficiency of operation. The past history of railroading will have its influence on the future of the entire industry. It is for this reason that the past history of the railroads of the country should be of value to the investor in his consideration of railroad bonds. End of section 4 Read by Elsie Selwyn Section 5 of Railroads from the Investor's Viewpoint by the Federal Securities Corporation. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Railroad Securities 3. Railroad Securities The average investor is probably much better acquainted with the factors to be considered in judging railroad securities than he is with the past or even more recent history of the railroads of the United States. It is for this reason that we have outlined as fully as the booklet would permit the history of the railroads and will condense as much as clearness and accuracy will permit the detail of those factors essential of consideration in the purchase of railroad bonds. The two important factors. Whether the investment be railroad, municipal, utility, or industrial bond, there are two fundamentals which govern its worth. One the lien position of the bond itself, and two, the credit position of the issuing corporation. There is a third consideration which often influences investors' minds as to the worth of a bond, namely marketability. But it is obvious that marketability has no bearing on security, and it is security that we wish solely to take into account. So far in this booklet, in parts one and two, we have dealt only with the second of these two large considerations, the credit position of the roads. We have outlined the credit position of the railroads of the country as a whole, especially during the past few chaotic years, and we have indicated here and there the credit positions of various individual roads. We have given sufficient outline of the various ups and downs of the railroad systems of the country to need no further emphasis on the point that the credit of a road is of great importance. We have seen sound roads like the New England systems gradually grow into a situation of great financial weakness. We have also seen other roads like the Atchison in the Northern Pacific change from a position of financial weakness to one of considerable financial strength. Again, we know that certain properties like the Pennsylvania, the New York Central, the Louisville and Nashville, and Illinois Central started with the ideal of conservative capitalization and strong financial position, continue through the decades to maintain this strong financial structure and credit. Although a record of the past is generally conceded to be a fair guarantee of the future, we must remember that there are notable instances when a record of the past proved a sad guarantee of the future. This point must be kept in mind in considering the records which we have just reviewed. So far, we have emphasized the importance of the credit position of the railroads in judging their investments. 
but the factor of credit position should not be overemphasized at the expense of the other consideration, namely the lien position of the bond. Both should be considered jointly in order to determine what is a sound investment. Sometimes investors are prone to emphasize one of these factors at the expense of the other. The lien position of one of the railroads now and a weak credit position may in itself be exceedingly strong, but it is not a very comfortable feeling to realize that the credit of the system may jeopardize the payment of principal and interest in spite of the inherent strength of the investment. On the other hand, too much emphasis should not be placed on the mortgage position of a certain bond. This fact was most convincingly brought out in the reorganization a few years ago of the Missouri Pacific system. Holders of first mortgage bonds issued at a low rate per mile on branch lines, which were not very valuable in earning power to the system, were in the reorganization given less desirable securities in exchange for their holdings than the holders of junior securities on mainline mileage. It did them little good to complain because it mattered very little to the general good of the system whether these lines were included or divorced in reorganization. They contributed practically nothing to the credit position of the road. Then, too, the credit position of a road may be so emphasized that the lien position of a security is forgotten, as, for example, in the case of the Southern Pacific Company Convertible Fours, which are merely unsecured obligations of a holding company. When, however, good security, as determined by lien position, is coupled with good credit, the investor has a very high type of investment security. The two factors which we are now considering are in many ways bound to one another. It follows that the bonds of a road conservatively capitalized enjoy a better lien position than those of a road which is overcapitalized. It also follows that a road which has a low bonded debt per mile is in a better earning power position than one which has a large bonded indebtedness, traffic possibilities in the two territories being equal. Investors who study railroad investments carefully, and especially those who may be acquainted with Mr. Moody's analysis of railroad investments, instinctively combine these two considerations in analyzing a railroad investment that may be offered. There are many considerations which may be taken into account in analyzing a railroad security, but the bondman and the well-posted investor simmer these down to one. Namely, a comparison of the bonded debt of the road per mile with the earning power of the road per mile. This one consideration combines the two factors of lien position and credit position, as will at once be evident. The lien position is indicated by the bonded debt per mile. The credit position is indicated by the net earnings per mile. To illustrate what we mean, we will use certain figures taken from the last current volume of Moody's analysis of railroad investments. To take a very extreme case, we will compare the indebtedness and the earning power of the Atchison with the indebtedness and earning power of the Erie. In 1919, the per mile bonded debt of the Atchison was slightly less than $25,000, and in 1917, the last figures given by Mr. Moody, the net earnings per mile were $5,342. The ERA, on the other hand, showed bonded indebtedness per mile in excess of $126,000 and net earnings per mile for 1917 of $5,439. Even though the ERA may have more second and third track mileage than the Atchison, it is at once apparent that most of the securities of a road with a bonded indebtedness of $126,000 per mile have a less desirable lien position than the securities of a road with a bonded indebtedness of $25,000 per mile. It is also apparent that a road faced with the necessity of paying interest on securities outstanding at the rate of $126,000 per mile enjoys a less desirable credit position than one which must pay interest on securities at the rate of $25,000 per mile, the net earnings per mile of each system being about the same. These are extreme cases chosen deliberately to illustrate our point. Most of the roads will fall somewhere between these two extremes as the Atchison is one of the most conservatively capitalized of roads, enjoying the highest measure of credit, whereas the Erie has earned much the opposite reputation.
all the other roads in the country fall in their own respective niches in a comparison of this kind, and the investor who wishes to determine these facts can obtain them from the good investment houses. It would be interesting to compare all of the important roads of the country in a test of this character, but the scope of this booklet will not permit. We believe we can say, however, that it should not be difficult for the investor to conclude for himself from the information which has been given in this booklet which are the roads whose lean position and credit position rank high and those whose positions are less desirable. Classes of Railroad Bonds A brief discussion of the different types of railroad bonds and the general esteem in which each type is held should be of interest to the investor. We feel that the investor is more or less familiar with these classes of railroad bonds, and therefore our discussion will be brief. First, we will consider those bonds which are secured by mortgage on the mileage of the railroad system. These naturally fall into four groups. 1. Divisional liens. 2. First mortgage general system liens. 3. General or refunding mortgages. 4. Collateral mortgages. Divisional liens. The divisional liens came into being through the growth of great systems and by consolidation of small properties. A line of several hundred miles originally operated as a separate unit and having outstanding against it first mortgage bonds would in consolidation become a part of a larger system. The first mortgage bonds of this original line thereby became divisional liens of the larger system. The Chicago and Northwestern, for example, is made up of many small roads which have gradually been absorbed into the parent system. The New York Central is an end-to-end -end consolidation of a great many small properties. Practically every large system in the country has its divisional liens. As a general rule, such issues are of high character, especially in roads of good credit and the bonds sell at the top prices. However, it must be borne in mind that just because a bond is a divisional lien, it is not necessarily strong because first mortgage divisional issues may fare badly with a road of weak credit as in the instance of the Missouri Pacific reorganization. However, when a divisional lien covers an important part of the mileage, the investment is usually conservative. An example of a very strong divisional lien is the C, B, and Q Illinois Division 4% bonds which cover practically the entire mileage of the Burlington system in Illinois and the line running from Chicago to the Twin Cities. The Great Northern has a number of issues of divisional bonds issued at various times as Mr. Hill expanded the Great Northern system, all of which are very high grade but which are very rarely seen in the market because they have been put away in places from which they do not come out. These are only a few of a great number of very fine divisional issues. First Mortgage General System Liens The second class of mortgage bonds are those which are secured by a first mortgage on much of the mainline mileage of the large systems, and are generally considered very high-grade investments. The Northern Pacific Prior Lien Fours, the Union Pacific First and the Land Grant Fours, the CB and Q General Fours, and the Atchison General Fours are outstanding examples of this type of investment. The last two issues mentioned are called general mortgage bonds, and while they are not secured by first mortgage on all of the property which they cover, they are nevertheless a first mortgage on a considerable portion of the mainline mileage. Such issues are usually better known and enjoy a wider general market than the divisional liens because the amounts outstanding are larger and give a greater trading opportunity. General Mortgages as the roads grew and new need for money arose, it became necessary for the systems to do financing by means of junior bond issues since most of the mileage was already covered by first mortgages. It is in this manner that refunding mortgages or the first and refunding mortgages of the railroads came into being. In the 80s and 90s, when this type of financing was first brought out on a scale, the mortgages were called general mortgages rather than refunding mortgages. In most cases, these general mortgages cover at least a part of the mileage by first mortgage and sufficient bonds are reserved to retire the underlining liens as they become due. 
Usually such issues were made to run over a period of a hundred years and covered the entire property of the road as constituted at the time of issue, including the terminals and equipment. Sometimes when such issues were brought out, a considerable portion of the mileage was not mortgaged as in the case of the CB and Q and the Atchison mentioned above, so that these general mortgage bonds covered several thousand miles of road as a first mortgage. The investor is acquainted with the general mortgage bonds of the Northwestern, the Northern Pacific, the Pennsylvania, and other roads which have outstanding this class of security. Refunding Mortgages In recent years, these general mortgage bonds have not been used largely because they were limited under the terms of the indentures to interest not to exceed 4% and only to refund underlining liens. Instead, the systems have used the refunding mortgage bonds to finance their requirements. These refunding mortgages were so drawn as to carry a higher coupon rate than 4% and were authorized in amounts in excess of the underlying lien requirements, thus affording the roads the opportunity of obtaining additional working capital. In cases where a road has outstanding both a general mortgage and a refunding mortgage, the general mortgage has usually been closed and the refunding mortgage covers the same property, and anything additional which the road may have acquired since the general mortgage was issued. Therefore, most of the refunding mortgages are secured by first mortgage on a small amount of mileage and by a second and third and in some cases by a fourth mortgage on the main portion of the road. There are some systems in which this character of lien has been given the name of refunding and improvement mortgage, as in the case of the New York Central. Most of the large systems have outstanding refunding liens of one character or another. In the case of roads of high credit, these bonds are well regarded. For example, the refunding four and a halfs of the Northern Pacific, which is a road of high credit, have always sold at higher prices than the refunding bonds of the B&O, which has not at all times in its history enjoyed the highest standard of credit. Collateral Mortgages The collateral mortgages can be dealt with rather briefly. In the true sense of the word, collateral mortgages secured by the deposit of other securities are not a direct mortgage online, although bonds may be deposited under them which are secured by direct mortgage. In other cases, collateral issues may be secured by deposits of stocks and other junior securities. The Southern Pacific Company Collateral Trust 4s of 1949, for example, are secured by the deposit of certain amounts of the stock of the Central Pacific Railway Company. The Illinois Central has outstanding two issues of collateral trust 4% bonds due in 1952 and in 1953, each of which is secured by a first lien on important mileage through the deposit of all of the liens outstanding on this mileage. These bonds were made collateral trust issues of the Illinois Central because the credit of the Illinois Central was higher than that of the unknown individual lines whose bonds were outstanding. This is usually the reason for the issuance of collateral trust bonds. This issuance of collateral trust issues can be carried to excess, as was done in the case of the Erie, and for this reason collateral issues should be carefully scrutinized, especially since the tendency of the investor in considering issues of this kind is to emphasize the credit position of the road at the expense of the lien position of the bonds. Many roads have outstanding several other classes of securities, namely debenture, convertible, income, terminal, and equipment bonds. Debenture bonds. Debenture issues may or may not be secured by mortgage. Usually at the time the debenture bond is issued, it is not secured by mortgage, but merely is the obligation of the company to pay. Debenture indentures, however, often carry the provision that if any further securities are put out on the property, the debentures in their turn are equally to be secured with the new bonds. The New York Central Debenture 4s of 1934, which are a well-known bond, and the Debenture 4s of 1932 are both equally secured with the New York Central Consolidated 4s of 1998, which are a second, third, fourth, and fifth lien on parts of the New York Central property. The Lakeshore and Michigan Southern Debenture 4s of 1928 and 1931 similarly are equally secured with the Lakeshore and Michigan Southern 3.5s. 
On the other hand, the convertible debenture sixes due in 1935 are not secured by mortgage. Again, in the case of issues of this character, the investor would do well to scrutinize carefully the lien position of the bond as well as to consider the credit position of the road. Convertible Bonds In recent years, convertible bonds have flourished. In some instances, convertible issues have been put out without any mortgage security, as in the case of the Southern Pacific Company Convertible Force of 1929 and the Union Pacific Convertible Force of 1927, which, however, are no longer convertible. In more recent years, the convertible bonds have been equally secured with the refunding or with the refunding and improvement bonds, which immediately antedated the issuance of the convertible bonds. For example, the B&O convertible four and a halfs are equally secured with the refunding in general fives and sixes due in 1995, and the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul convertible fives of 2014 are equally secured with the general and refunding four and a halfs of the same date. This road also has outstanding some convertible four and a halfs due in 1932, which are equally secured with both the convertible fives and the general and refunding bonds. It may be of interest that the debenture fours of 1934 and the gold fours of 1925 are equally secured with both the general and refunding four and a halfs and the two convertible issues which we have mentioned. This is a field which is very complicated and where the most careful character of scrutiny should be paid to issues in considering them as investments. They should be judged, as in previous cases, by the lien position of the bond and the credit position of the road in conjunction, without the overemphasizing of either one of the two factors. Income Bonds We have previously mentioned that in receivership and reorganization, the important thing has always been to reduce the fixed charges of the road within the limit of the road's net earnings. One of the ways of accomplishing this purpose is to permit the outstanding par value amount of securities to remain unchanged, but to make the interest on part of the bonds payable only if earned. It is in this manner that income bonds, or adjustment income bonds, as they are sometimes called, came into being. In the Atchison reorganization of 1895, this procedure was followed, with the result that we have outstanding today the Atchison Adjustment Fours, which, while secured by mortgage on the property, are payable as to interest only if that interest is earned. Up to July 1st, 1900, this interest was not even cumulative, but since that time it has been cumulative and is paid out of surplus. The Seaboard Airline II, as a result of its recent reorganization, has had outstanding since 1909 an issue of $25 million adjustment fives, the interest on which is payable only if earned. The interest on these bonds has been cumulative from the beginning. The St. Louis and San Francisco Railway Company has outstanding two issues of this character as a result of its reorganization. The cumulative adjustment sixes, which are payable as to interest from available net income, but which are cumulative, and the income mortgage sixes due in 1960, which are payable out of the available net income of the company for each fiscal year ending June 30th, after payment of interest on the cumulative adjustment sixes. The interest on these latter bonds is not cumulative. In each of these cases, the bonds are a mortgage on property securing the payment of the principal, but as the interest is payable only if earned, the worth of such issues is largely dependent upon the credit position of the road. As a general case, income bonds are not highly regarded, although the adjustment fours of the Atchison rank almost on the same plane with other high-grade 4% railway bonds of roads of the best credit. The reason for this, of course, is the excellent credit which the Atchison has enjoyed almost continuously since its reorganization in 1895. Terminal Bonds From the standpoint of security position and credit position, it is difficult to find a higher grade investment than a terminal bond issued against properties located in the larger cities. These bonds are safeguarded in several ways. First, they are usually a mortgage on terminal properties, either passenger or freight or both, which are very valuable because they are usually located in the business center of the city. Second, the interest on these bonds is usually made an operating charge against the roads which use the terminal. Third, the bonds are very often guaranteed in addition as to both principal and interest by the user railroads. 
There have been a number of instances where roads which have been in receivership and have been in default on even first mortgage bonds on their systems have continued to pay interest on the terminal bonds. The reason for this is that in order to continue to operate, the roads must continue to use the terminals, and in order to get into the terminals, it is necessary to pay the terminal charges which cover the interest on the bonds. The terminal charge is generally regarded as an operating charge and is considered to come ahead of all bond interest on the other securities of the railroad. The Chicago Union Station six and a halfs, which are guaranteed by the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, the Pennsylvania, and the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul, and are an operating charge against these three roads and the Chicago and Alton, are possibly one of the best chosen investments of this group. The terminal companies operating in Kansas City, St. Louis, and St. Paul have also outstanding terminal bonds, which are very highly regarded. And in a general way, the terminal bonds of companies in the larger centers of population offer opportunity for conservative investment which it is impossible to excel. Equipment Bonds Equipment bonds generally enjoy a reputation much like that of terminal issues. A road cannot operate without its equipment, and when issued by good roads, equipment bonds in the past have always been considered one of the very highest forms of railroad investment. Again, as in the case of terminal issues, roads which have been in receivership and in default on mortgage bonds have continued to pay interest in principal on their equipment issues when due. It is the usual procedure at the present time to issue these equipment bonds under the Philadelphia plan. Under this plan, the title to the equipment does not remain in the railroad company itself, but a trust is created and the title to the equipment remains with the trustee until the final installment of the notes is paid. In this case, instead of being a direct obligation, the notes or certificates are guaranteed by the railroad which rents the equipment from the trustee, the rentals being sufficient to take care of interest and maturities when due. The investor, on his part, does not receive the note of the railroad company itself, but the certificate of the trustee, secured by the equipment whose title rests in the trustee. The general record of equipment bonds has been unusually good, and when issued by roads of good credit, such certificates must be considered as being extremely high-grade investments. End of Section 5 Read by Elsie Selwyn Section 6 of Railroads from the Investor's Viewpoint by the Federal Securities Corporation. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Conclusion This booklet makes no attempt to treat with justice any phase of the railroad situation. The history of operation of the railroads from the time of our entry into the war up to the present time has been treated with most detail, but by no means exhaustively. The primary idea of this booklet is to give the investor a bird's-eye view of the past history of the roads, the problems which they have faced in the past few years and are facing today, and the factors to be considered in judging railroad investments. The primary idea of this booklet is to give the investor a bird's-eye view of the past history of the roads, the problems which they have faced in the past few years and are facing today, and the factors to be considered in judging railroad investments. Many questions which the investor will ask are answered in these pages. It is our hope that the most important ones have been covered. Many questions unanswered will occur to the investor who reads this booklet thoughtfully and with care. To such, the Federal Securities Corporation extends its fullest service. If there are analyses of particular bonds or of individual railroad systems which the investor would like, we will be glad to supply the information on request. Our desire in publishing this booklet is the same as that in every department of our business, to serve the investor to the utmost of our ability. End of Section 6 Read by Elsie Selwyn End of Railroads from the Investor's Viewpoint by the Federal Securities Corporation